as I had you know, at least a few moments to reflect on my career, I was very grateful for, I think, many opportunities that help prepare somebody as much as anybody can be prepared for a job of such broad scope and responsibility. So uh, you know, I, I, I think that I really had an opportunity to make good on some of the criticisms maybe that I held uh, about the direction that our foreign policy, our national security strategy had taken in, in recent years. I, I felt as if you know, we, we had been complacent and overconfident in the post-Cold War period, and that overconfidence had somehow shifted to really pessimism, almost defeatism in more recent years. And, and so I, I felt that this was a tremendous opportunity to help restore our strategic competence as a nation at a time when, at which I felt that we are, we're really, and I think today, we are at the end of the beginning of a new era. And I think that we're behind. We're behind because we weren't competing effectively uh, in, against really critical rivals and, and adversaries. We had become, I think, passive in, in, in connection with this overconfidence. And then I believed that in more recent years, we had seen our disengagement from complex problem sets overseas as an unmitigated good. Well, I, I just think that any opportunity to serve is a privilege, you know? And, and I think that maybe sometimes in our society today, we tend to look at service in the military through, uh, I think, the, the lens of popular culture. And I think these days, popular culture tends to cheapen and coarsen uh, military service and the, and the warrior ethos in, in particular. And, and what service in our military, what service in our intelligence agencies, in our government broadly, gives you an opportunity to do is to be part of something bigger than yourself and to be part of a team in our military in which the man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives for you. And so I think that there are these less tangible rewards that it's difficult for people, to, that are difficult for people to see. I mean, it's much easier to see you know, the risks and, and, and the sacrifices and the hardships associated with service. So I was anxious for the, and, and grateful for the opportunity uh, to serve as, as National Security Advisor. And, uh, and you know, I, I think that we were able to, in that year, uh, serve the president well, and I think administer, in many cases, a corrective to what had been unwise policies, or really the absence of policies and strategies for what I think we now recognize are, are our greatest challenges to national security. Well, I think the most important skills that I, I was able to bring to this job, I think was, was mainly the gift I'd been given by the Army to, as my full-time job, read, think, study, discuss, and write about history. And, and the topic that I chose turned out to be quite relevant, which was a topic that involved national security decision-making uh, in, in time of, of war. And, and I, so I think that that academic perspective, as well as the range of experiences, helped me understand better my responsibilities, uh, and, then, and then how to best serve the president and the country in that, in that job. Now, as Secretary Schultz can tell you better than anybody, there really is no ideal preparation for these jobs where you have such a broad scope of, of responsibility. But I, I think the experiences that are relevant are experiences that help you ask the right questions, help you frame problems so you can first understand. I think sometimes as Americans, we rush right to, okay, what are we going to do about this? And, we, and as a result, we can confuse activity with, with progress. I think it's skills that involve the ability to build teams, to build teams across multiple organizations and bring to bear on a challenge or a problem an interdisciplinary perspective. People who think differently about these problems and then bring with them across our departments and agencies different tools and different ways to address, to address these problems. Identify the synergies that, can be, that we can achieve you know, between various efforts. And then I think a, a, a skill set or an experience that's important is, I think it's important to understand what it takes to get something done, right? Not to talk about it, not to write a policy paper, but how do you implement a, a strategy? And then it doesn't hurt, I don't think, to have on the ground experience in really complex environments that involve multiple political, economic, social, cultural dynamics. Because I think what you want to be able to do is to be able to think about these problems in a way that allows you to understand what the obstacles are to overcome, 
uh, but also to see where there are opportunities, to understand how you can influence your efforts along with like-minded partners, these situations, to kind of shift the balance in favor of our interests and our principles and our, our values. And, and so I, I think it's important to have a sense of the difficulties, uh, but, but also to not be, not be paralyzed you know, by, by risks and difficulties and to see beyond that to opportunities. But uh, at the same time, recognize the limits of the agency and control you have over some of these complex problems. You want to think there are five main responsibilities you have as a national security advisor, but one of them is to run a process that allows coordination and integration across all the departments and agencies to give the president options, right? And, and, to, and to help develop, as you, as you present these options, develop integrated strategies designed to advance and protect American interests and promote American prosperity and to advance our influence and, and, and our principles. And so, so that, that process uh, that we put in place was modeled very consciously uh, 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 after uh, General Scowcroft's model. And I spent two hours in his office. He was very gracious, and, and, uh, and he gave me tremendous advice, as did, as did the other former national security advisors as well. All of them had a different perspective. All of them highlighted different lessons. And, and you know, I had the opportunity to, to speak with, uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Brzezinski. Uh, and it turned out, that, you know, sadly, this was just a, maybe a month or two months before he, he passed away. And, and, um, and he focused mainly on the importance of relationships and fostering effective relationships. So I, I think it, it was tremendously valuable to me to consult those who could help me think about these new duties and responsibilities uh, in the context of how could I best serve the president and the country. The second responsibility is to run that process, to run the process to deliver options to the president, to, to, to draft and, and request approval for strategies to advance and protect our interests, to run a process that, that, that allows you to respond rapidly to crises if, if they occur, uh, and then to run a process also that, that assists really with the sensible execution. You don't execute from the White House, but to, to understand you know, what are the actions, initiatives, programs that are to be done simultaneously, sequentially, and, and then to help curate those strategies and efforts over time. So it's, it's staffing the president, it's that process. The third is to help communicate the president's decisions and actions across the departments and agencies and to relevant audiences. The fourth key aspect of the job is to help maintain unity of effort with allies, with partners, like-minded partners uh, internationally. And, and so while, of course, that is the primary responsibility of the, of the Secretary of State, engaging with your counterparts and the offices of their presidents and prime ministers is, is an important function as well. Uh, and, and then finally, you have to lead. You have to lead an organization of extremely dedicated, talented people, which was a real privilege for me. And to, to make them feel like they're part of an organization that's bound together by mutual trust and, and respect and common purpose, to, to know that they're going to work every day and they're making a difference for, the, for their country and for the president. Uh, and then to, to build an organization also in that fifth area responsibility of leadership that, that is valued and trusted across our government and, and by, by foreign uh, governments and so forth. So uh, of the first of those, you know, staffing the president, I, I think what I concluded is that I, I owed the president the best from across our government and a, and a process that would, that would deliver that. Uh, that entailed certainly you know, not telling the president you know, what he wanted to hear, right? And, and, and I think that it would be a disservice to any, any president to do that. And, and, um, and it's, it's not courageous. I, think, I didn't have the courage to not tell the president you know, what, what I thought the president didn't want to hear, right? I mean, uh, I, think, I think that that's, that's an important aspect of, of those responsibilities. And then I think also well, a lesson that I brought into, into this is that you know, we, we need to have strategies. <laughs> I mean, we need to have goals and objectives. And we need to we need to improve our strategic competence. I made that really an explicit goal for us. There are those who are there to serve the president and the country. And, and they see it in, this, in the context of a national security advisor job, for example, of presenting options to the president, recognizing that, hey, the American people elected the president. And so, and so it's your job to present options and then to assist with the execution of that president's decisions. I think there's a second group of people who serve, in, again, in any administration, and these are people who are there 
maybe not necessarily to serve the president, uh, but they're there to serve their own agendas. And, and rather than give that president options, what they would prefer to do is try to manipulate decisions to get outcomes consistent with their agenda, again, not the president's agenda. And then I think there sometimes is a third group of, uh, of people who sort of cast themselves in the role of saving the country, you know, or maybe the world from the president, right? And so, so, the, so, <laughs> but, so I, I, think, I think that really the only true motivation is, is that first group. Because the second group and the third group are actually undermining the Constitution of the United States. Hey, guess what? Nobody elected you, you know, <laughs> into your position. And therefore, you're not accountable directly to the American people. And so the, the checks on a president, for example, should be exercised through the American people because, you know, that was the radical idea of our revolution, is that sovereignty doesn't lie with a king. It doesn't lie even with a parliament. It lies with the people. And they exercise their will through elections of, of the executive, uh, of the chief executive, of the president, but also the elections of their representatives in Congress who, based on the brilliance of our founders, uh, balance the executive branch along with the judiciary. So, so I, 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 I saw my role as doing the best I could to serve the elected president uh, and to do so consistent with the Constitution. 